Hello, welcome back to the podcast. I've got Terry Chu with me, and Terry does some interesting stuff in fintech. And I'm going to grill him, and um, just in usual fashion, just to say this is like the magician's disclaimer, Terry. This is <laughs> unscripted. We're just going to talk about stuff. You have no idea what I'm going to say next, right, Terry? Absolutely not. We've got no notes, no nothing. He's not giving me any any heads up. So, Terry, Be interesting. You, do you just want to introduce yourself and introduce what you do so that people can get a flavor of who you are, what you're about? Sure. I, uh, my name is Terry. I run a business called Venture Motion, and we help uh, small businesses, particularly in the, fin in the finance sector, automate uh, and smooth out their processes um, and essentially help them uh, scale their business without scaling headcount. Oh, that sounds clever. So, um, Terry, how long have you been in this kind of financial tech world? Well, it's 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 it's, it's, it's worth a note that we, we don't always just help finance companies, although the majority of our clients are finance clients. I've been in. I just to uh, just to sort of step back a little bit, just to give some uh, perspective to the journey. Um, I used to run an all um, uh, a, a digital agency uh, mm -hmm. that did everything. You know, as digital agencies used to do. We did SEO, PPC, uh, web builds, social media, uh, and whatnot. Um, and um, I sold that business um, or my share of the business in 2015. Um, and a, a great big portion of our work was helping businesses in the financial sector, mainly people that lent money to other businesses, business lending B2B. Um, and it was great in helping them drive traffic, drive leads and drive more revenue. But there was always that thing of growth and scaling that all businesses want to do, but mm -hmm. nobody actually looks and ste steps back and looks and actually we're driving all these leads and all this revenue, but actually we could squeeze more out of what we've already got. Mm -hmm. There's never, you've always got a sales department, you've always got a marketing department and you've always got someone in operations, but you haven't, you've never got somebody who looks at what happens in between you know marketing mm -hmm. blame sales sales blame marketing and everyone blames operations and it got to a point where clients were asking for we need more we need more we need more and it was always more it wasn't kind of looking at what have we got and how much more can we squeeze out of it mm -hmm. and that's kind of where the pain points start that the pain points started was I realized that actually all these organizations, large and small, you know, we used to have a client that was 300 million pounds. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, relatively large business. And every year they would have these huge growth plans year on year. This is how much percentage we need to grow. But actually, when you looked under the hood, um, actually, they didn't need to grow. They just needed to optimize the stuff that they were already doing. So out mm -hmm. of, you know, a thousand leads that they were getting, they were converting maybe 300 of them. What's mm -hmm. happened to the 700? No one cared because everyone on the board level said, well, if this is how much we need to spend to get 300 customers, we'll double it to get 600. But mm -hmm. no one was asking the questions because everyone, wants to, everyone always wants to protect their own departments and their mm -hmm. own jobs. And so they, 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 they tell you know, bosses what they want to hear, and that is, give me more budget and I'll give you more. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of when the interest started of how can we optimize what's going on and squeeze more out of it and it, it was a case that actually no one had the no one had the intel or the insights to say what was going on between people bringing in leads in and people selling to those leads no one mm -hmm. was actually saying oh actually it was because no one was calling those leads quick enough for example mm -hmm. or no one was um we weren't doing the due diligence we were spending all our time calling leads that were rubbish leads and mm -hmm. not calling those ones that were great leads because no one knew mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so um so that was kind of from 2010 onwards and then i sold my business in 2015 to focus on a consultancy that would help businesses uh, essentially get more of our, not spend more, but get mm -hmm. more out of what they're doing now. Mm -hmm. um, and that quickly became great. So, I, you know, I had a few clients with me that, again, so in the financial sector, and that quickly became a technology solution. You know, the consultancy mm -hmm. that I was doing saying, this is what you need to do more of, turned into, 
we could automate a lot of this stuff so that you don't need to increase headcount. We could mm -hmm. do this with technology. Um, so things like, for example, um, a lead comes in to a client. Um, what's their credit like? Mm -hmm. How long have they been in business? What's their revenue like? Um, not what they're telling you, what, what actually is it? Mm -hmm. um, and, and quickly taking a lead through an automation system and saying, actually, that leads rubbish because they've only been trading for six months. Mm -hmm. And actually, the credit looks okay for the business, but the director's got rubbish credit, which means that potentially they might be in danger because, yeah. et cetera. So it was providing that intel before any of the salespeople called it so that it wouldn't waste their time. Mm -hmm. um, and also, it would mean that any leads that they did call, it was a good lead because we've done all the intel, we've done the credit mm -hmm. checks or the soft checks, and we've done some due diligence before uh, it got to the <clears throat> got to the salesperson. And so that solution there became a tech solution, and that's what we build now. Mm -hmm. We build a tech solution um, for our clients to um, it's bringing big tech to small businesses. Mm -hmm. And where where does that flaw go in terms of? you know any business can automate and i i always say there's some things you can automate sure yeah like repeti repetitive tasks yeah so uh, i'll bring my context in here there's a lot of things like you know calendar reminders you can automate you can automate you know um appointment booking in the sense of people can go in and find a time you can automate to some degree getting the leads in with ads and various different things but there's some bits that you can't automate. How do you, uh, I don't know whether you've seen this, though. I'll give you an example. There's a, what I'd class as a challenger bank. And at the moment, they are not even sending newsletters, but they're sending very template looking, drop the name in, hmm. dear Dean. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's some things you can automate that works yeah. well. How do you go about, when you're working with a client going this will automate but this won't or this will be clunky if you try to yeah yeah no it's a great question and i completely agree coming from you know an automation agency um <clears throat> you think that we want to automate everything and that's not true so you, you picked up on a really good point there there are things that still need that human touch ai can't touch everything mm -hmm. i think where we stand here is we build tools and systems that give the human the enough insight and intel to make a decision and that's mm -hmm. where the decision engine comes in place is that the decision engine can make that decision for you and uh, and provide you know um a trigger so uh, an action after the end of it but actually most most of our clients don't use our decision engine technology for that they use it to take out all the guesswork they take it they, they use it to take out the, the the repetitiveness so as an example a lot of our lenders when before they lend money they they not only do the the standard stuff like credit checks and things like that but they also want to see your bank statements you know even with you know we work with mortgage lenders and mortgage brokers as well quite often when you're going for a mortgage um they'll want to see you know three six twelve months worth of bank statements mm -hmm. so you'll give that to them just to back up you know your income and expenditure but quite often when you give those um, those those bank statements, whether it's a paper form or PDF or or, or, or whatever format, somebody's got to look through that and actually yeah. assess. Oh, actually, that's that looks like a gambling site, or actually that looks like mm. um, that looks like additional income. So it could be a good thing, you know, mm. that they had that the client hasn't, you know, considered. But all that stuff takes time when you're looking at three, six, twelve months. And so when a broker or a lender is looking at that, that is somebody's job to look through those and it's a very repetitive job and yeah. mistakes can happen as well as part of our decision engine we have algorithms that basically scan electronic uh bank statements either electronic bank statements in pdf or we have open banking technology that allows the user to connect to their bank straight away pulls in real time yeah uh, banking data uh and you, you may have used it yourself and what happens then is our decision engines quickly can go through categorize and look through and actually then decide actually their income is actually this not what they said mm -hmm. and their expenditure is actually this on entertainment something that they didn't disclose and something and actually um their child care looks more than one child for example 
you know, and they only put one. So all these things are quickly delivered within seconds because there's an algorithm that, that, that looks through. Now, that doesn't mean that the decision engine makes the decision for the client. Mm. It gives them intel quicker, something that might mm. take a day to or half a day to analyze and decide, oh, actually, is that entertainment or is that not? Mm. Our technology basically helps them scan, retrieve, and review. It's almost like uh, not credit scoring, but it's like another form of scoring. To it say, is scoring, exactly. These are the people you could, you know, these are people, tick, 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 tick. Guys, these are the ones to prioritize because everything's in order, get the deal done kind of thing. These are the ones where there might be a bit more work. These are the potentially non-starters that you might want to look through to check, but actually don't spend a lot of time there because the likelihood of them actually coming to something are slim. Exactly. Is that a fair appraisal of how That's it works? exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. And it's helped. It, so it's, 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 it's not taking over, although it can, it's aiding. And it can, you know, I think with automation is it's not down to the technology. It's also down to the user on how far they want to take it as well. Mm -hmm. You know, you could automate everything from end to end, like you yeah. said, but would it be really good? Would the experience be good? Probably not. Yeah. You know, you know, I, I could, I could, I could automate my entire, I could in automate my child, my nine year old doing her homework. And she was already, she's already tried to, you know, use Alexa a couple of times to try and answer her homework, but that's not going to be very good because, um, because you still need that element of human and the tonality and, you know, not everything in business can be automated. So I think it's down to the user figuring out which bits do need that human touch. And, you know, we're we're coming at we're maybe coming from different angles but i don't i mean i say to people on linkedin there's some things that automation's brilliant at mm -hmm. but you can't automate a conversation no absolutely not um you can you can send people information so like you know thanks for your application we might need some more information that kind of stuff's right dead easy mm. but when you get to decisions i don't think um, maybe i'm wrong here right and tell me i'm wrong i don't think yet we've got and i i don't think we want an ai that can totally replace humans am i am i off here? no I, I i i agree i i think in theory you could replace all the practical things that um the doing mm -hmm. you could probably replace things that maybe require some level of manual labor Mm -hmm. uh such as and i don't mean you know real manual i mean i mean kind of having to look things up or or review things i think when it i think the way i see it is that if your if if your business requires you to um have a conversation have a conversation and that conversation has to have some degree of value mm -hmm. and i don't mean just the the information within the, the the conversation i mean mm -hmm. the tone how it's delivered that human touch there's no way an ai could replace it it's like it's like um value and nuance i don't think ai can deal mm, with it I yeah mean, you see the whole chatbot with facebook yeah yeah <laughs> um facebook what they how much money do they make a year billions and billions mm. and billions they launch this chatbot that within because of human nature, uh, whether they're mischievous people, whether it's the AI is not there yet, convince it to start splurting out all sorts of things about Mark Zuckerberg and, and yeah, did you see it? yeah, that's right. I, I, it was it was. I, th I think I think also before that they tried to, and it again it was Facebook. They created um, two bots. Two, two, two AI bots, and you know they didn't exist. They just they just existed in 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 the in the code format, and they got them to talk to each other. And this was years and years ago. And what they had to shut it down because what happened was these bots quickly found a way to communicate more efficiently, and they started to create a new language between themselves. Mm. And so, because they were using you know, short codes and shortcuts and that short codes and shortcuts became shorter and shorter and shorter. It got to a stage where they were communicating in a language that no one actually understood and they had to shut it down because it was, they didn't know what they were, they didn't know that what they were up to. So I think, 
I think, you know, people talk about like Skynet and stuff like that. I know we're going off on a tangent here. I I think if people are worried about Skynet, I, I'm not worried that, you know, some, somehow AI gets control of nukes and stuff like that. I'm, I'm not in that camp that thinks that's the place we need to worry about. I do think we could become, we could create things that are too clever for us. Agreed. Uh, like I see this all the time in my world and, and, you know, LinkedIn automation or social media automation um, is dangerous if, if you try to be too clever with it, because it it's, it's only as good as the person inputting the information. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but you know, um, I don't think the Skynet thing's the pro problem. I think it's just actually us trying to do something where there's too many variables that we can't even think about the variables. Yeah. What the outcome might be. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> no, um, I, I completely agree. I completely but, agree. Where do you see automation? Because everybody's afraid that, you know, what's going to happen to people's jobs. Hmm. What do you think about that? Honest, is it is it a myth? Is it is it just a case of people will retrain universal income? What where do you see this automation AI thing going? Yeah, I mean, I think I think in in some sense it's a good thing, and I think what automation does it takes away all the it takes away all the stuff that can be um, all the repetitive stuff. So mm -hmm. let's look at, I mean, let's, let, let's look at two eras. Let's look at car building. You know, there was an era where, you know, all cars were built manually mm -hmm. by, by hand, you know, and now that's just a hobby, you know, and you know, no one would, no, no company would start, dare start a company and think, oh, we're going to build this by, we're going to build, you know, classic cars by hand and, you know, make a, you know, and scale it. No one's going to be able to scale that. If you look at the accountancy business now, you know, you know, 20 years ago, not even 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, you'd go to your accountant and they'd do the payroll, the bookkeeping and, you know, and do your day, the day to day stuff. Yeah. Zero does that mm -hmm. now. So now what happens is I don't go to my accountant for the bookkeeping, although they will do the bookkeeping, but I know it's not them that's doing it. Zero is doing it. I, I know I pay for it, mm -hmm. you know, and and the payroll and whatnot all that's all that's already automated but what i do go to my accountant for is hey do you know what do you know next year if i wanted to save this much in tax what are the things what are the activities that we need to do this year rather than next that higher level consultancy type mm. work is has become more important with accountants mm. than ever because ai don't have that information that don't have that kind of skill set at the moment mm. look at marketing you know in, in in the marketing world we i used to have a digital agency and uh, we used to charge clients for the most mundane of tasks because actually only we could do it and then where the reason why i sold that that, that share of the business was because i started to see on the horizon the likes of, um, you know, the, all these tools, tech tools that were coming into the marketing, just like Xero and the mm. QuickBooks did for the accounting industry, all these tools that would help automate and and look things up very quickly in the marketing, digital marketing industry. We were, we were charging clients for that, but then it would only take, you know, a savvy marketing director or a CMO to think, hang about and the penny drops think why are we paying these guys when mm -hmm. this 30 pound tool does that yeah so then that's when i went into the sold and went into the consultancy area because that was the bit that i knew i couldn't software couldn't replace that mm -hmm. was the bit that needed my um years of commercial experience mm -hmm. to, 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 to to input it's expertise that expertise that um you know, automation and AI can't replace. Absolutely. That, yeah. You can't like, learn that stuff. You know, I, you know, you can see some automated ad platforms now where they can generate, you know, um, ad copy and stuff, but I'm not so sure it's, it's fully there yet because AI can't predict necessarily human nature that easy, but that's nearly there mm. with, you know, copy a little bit. Yeah. But what's actually, the, what's the one? Jarvis. Jarvis is one. Jarvis, yeah, you've got yeah. some of these AI, but when you read them, it's like it's only as good as the input still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're right. <laughs> so, you're you know, right. Jarvis, you put the inputs in, you get what's out. But if you've been flawed at the input, the you, you know, 
So there's still a space for like expertise. And I think one of the things we've done is, is notice that now given like social media, for an example, there's a lot of automation that can come in. There's a lot of things that you can do, but you still can't, you still can't get that bit where it goes, how do I convince somebody to believe that I'm the solution to their problem? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the gap that automation can't fix right now. Agreed. Yeah. That they can get posts out. They can auto generate posts or even auto. Have you seen that Dally by the way? Yeah. Crazy with the imagery. Yeah. I mean, if people don't know about this, there is yeah. an AI website where you type in, I want a picture of a chicken standing on a roof in winter with the sun and moon in the sky. And it will generate that whole imagery amazing and it's like this is incredible i mean it's like uh, unbelievable um so there's all of that cool stuff coming which will make i don't know how that works for photographers <laughs> yeah yeah well there, yeah there you go i mean i, I don't think they have, have anything to worry about because again it's that thing where Sure, for, for that low-level work, again, it's all the same through all industries, through accountancy, through marketing, through photography. Sure, you can find a system to replace some of that low-level work where it's kind of, you can get away with, you know, a chicken that doesn't look quite like a chicken. It, but, you know, it, it, you can get a low-level work. But for somebody who's looking for a high-quality still, mm -hmm. And a, the AI still isn't quite there to figure out the tone and the light and the emotions that come out from mm. certain shadows. And, you know, it takes a human and that nuance to to understand what makes a piece of good photography, right? Yeah. And it's the same with, same with, your, with, with marketing and your industry where, and, and social media where kind of, yeah, sure, you can spit out posts and, you know, you can you can get the algorithm to regurgitate this in you know 10 different ways but certain words certain things that i say to you and you to me i'll feel something that an ai won't be able to feel yeah yeah so what does this mean for small businesses what do you see you know cuz you're involved in kind of obviously the financial services but you're also involved in e-commerce mm -hmm. and professional services where do you where do you see AI in that space of small businesses? You know, they're not going to be a massive startup, but they might, they might be building a little e-commerce business and they want to simplify as much as possible. Where do you see they, even if they're not maybe the size where you would have them as a client, what would be some of the things you'd be t telling them to think about or look at? Yeah, I mean, quite often, and, you know, in large and small business, SMEs, mid, you know, mid uh mid-sized business or even corporates everybody every single business i haven't seen a single business um that's become a client or had a conversation with or that hasn't become a client where they've got their entire process whether that's marketing whether that's sales 100 percent optimized mm. as in they're squeezing every single there's no there's no gaps you know i haven't seen a single one so let's just talk about e-commerce for as an example um we have a, a client um who is in the vaping industry and uh, mm -hmm. they sell online, you know, they, they do very well. Um, and the, again, the same thing, all business owners want growth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They want scale and they want growth. They want big numbers, but that often means we want more new customers and more sales and larger checkout baskets and, and, and carts, carts and etc. But then they forget about, Oh, actually, well, you know, Bob who buys once every month could actually buy once every week if we understood him well enough mm. if we understood what he actually buys and why he buys it and, and 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 having the data there to understand why bob buys what he buys what he's looked at in the past that he never put in his cart maybe stuff that he put in the cart and took it back out maybe mm. things he shared and all those things are data points which an e-commerce user can look at and think well actually bob only spends 30 pounds a month but actually he could spend 90 mm. and that is taking one customer out of, you know, tens of thousands to spend an extra 60 pounds. Whereas, you know, it's easy to get a customer who's already buying to spend more than it is to acquire a new customer. Mm. 
So that's what a lot of businesses, I think, do, small and large, is that they try and add new customers and get more. But what about their existing customers, their existing products and existing solutions? How can you squeeze more out of what they've already got, optimize what they've already got, and take a look at what they're actually doing now? And is it actually, you know, are you, are you getting leads and not calling them for a day? Mm -hmm. and then losing them to a competitor because somebody they found somebody else no one searches online and only goes to one person <laughs> no so let me ask you i was just having a brainwave and this might already exist but in an e-commerce world obviously you've got abandoned carts you've got email newsletters you've got all of that kind of stuff going on yeah which like people like shopify have got stuff built in and yep. what have you but I was just sat there thinking one of the great applications of AI, and this may already exist, is whereby, you know, Bob's looking on your website. Yeah. Bob decides to buy something for 30 quid, but you kind of know from tracking data tracking on the site that Bob's also looked at this and this and this and this. Uh, surely AI could do two things. First of all, it could collate the intel to say Bob's got a propensity to buy this. This is where he's spending is interest based on how long he's bought so we know who he is so we know bob looks at these things and he spent lots of time here and that tells us quite a lot about bob great so we now know that bob is interested in this this stuff great we also know bob generally is online on our website at these times mm -hmm. so surely you could end up with total programmatic email marketing where it's like actually we're not going to send ten thousand emails at seven o'clock we're actually going to send them bob's good at seven in the morning and he likes these things and sally over here it's these things yep. and it's two o'clock and so you end up with actually we've got a template ai pick the best products to put in there based on their user information and send it at the best times in the week for, for that person for that particular person yeah that's absolutely bang on that's exactly what that's exactly what it, what it is we do we we, we, we build those automations and that, and that is I mean you've taken it a step further there but yeah absolutely yeah the, the step further in terms of pinpointing Bob at 7 uh, 7 p.m or whatever time he normally comes onto the site yeah absolutely that's exactly that, that that's spot on that and that's and that's what a lot of business owners don't because the easiest thing is hey we'll just spend another 500 quid on ppc mm -hmm. and and get another you know what because it's easy to track it's easy to track and it's easy to say the bottom line has grown because we've got another 10 customers um it's much it's actually much harder to do that and convert 10 new customers than it is to, for like like you said to get bob and sally to spend another mm -hmm. 50 60 pounds more um and that is that that goes for everything in terms of optimizing what they've already got you you know you you don't need more leads you just need your leads to convert better or get better leads mm -hmm. see one of the things I, I know you're kind of you've got a lot of involvement in b2c and i'm b2b so there's 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 a bit of overlap here with the financial services bit and maybe a bit in e-commerce maybe maybe there's a lot of overlap but um one of the things that i say to people is it's not about necessarily just a volume of leads and you've kind of hinted at it there it's about the quality of the leads you get absolutely i'm a big believer and a lot of people don't like this right there's sometimes humans get a buzz from being getting things that are very unproductive right mm -hmm. so by this i mean I know one company, big tech company, they get a thousand leads a month, a thousand leads a month. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They can't convert many of them because a lot of them are what I'd class as people who are looking like they're, they're, they're downloading, they're signing up for stuff. They're not signing up with any intent. Mm, true. Yeah. There's yeah. no momentum or motivation behind the sign up. Mm -hmm. So I get one. I get one at the moment. I'm not going to say the name, but they're a big ERP platform. And they're putting out Facebook ads saying, do you want to grow your business? Now, given, let's ignore that it's Facebook for a minute. Let's just ignore that and just assume that they've got the targeting right. Mm -hmm. Growing your business in an ERP platform is a very, it's 
it's a direct but tenuous connection mm -hmm. because people down in growing your business is leads and sales. Yeah. But actually they're, they're an indirect growth mechanism. So they're getting people downloading. They're get, I'm getting the follow-ups and the phone calls and all that stuff. But it didn't sat the the campaign didn't satisfy my needs. I've lost where I'm going with this, but no, I think I knew. I know exactly where you're going with it in terms of that the intent was is there. The the intent is the most important thing on in that campaign rather than the volume. Yeah. Yeah. And you can analyze with with kind of even you know even with a bit of ai you can you can kind of go okay these people are coming from this campaign what's the conversion rate of this campaign mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where is it breaking down and what's the intent um, there's various different tools now you can gauge intent and propensity and stuff like that which for a small business might be um you know, a, a bridge too far for them. But what I'm trying to get at is all leads are not equal. Mm, absolutely. Oh yeah. Bang on. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and you know, this tech company was like, yeah, we're really impressed with the leads. We just can't get them to convert. Mm. And then I was talking to another company who was doing the same thing, high converting ad. So they're getting leads. Are you ready for this? This is a true stat. I'm not like, making this up i was going to swear then but i'm not making this up they were quite happy to spend twenty thousand pounds on campaigns to get one conversion hmm. because the conversion was worth a quarter of a million quid wow okay fab wonderful right and they'd never taken the time to actually analyze what made those conversions happen mm -hmm, mm -hmm to kind of go, let's stop spending 20 grand. Can we spend a grand? And they're That's like, it. No, don't That's... tinker with it. Don't tinker with it. It's working. It's like, no, 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 it's not working. <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> but um, your stuff, you can you can look at that and go, what were the commonalities? There you go. Exactly. There you go. That, that made somebody convert versus didn't convert. And then mm -hmm. you can learn to go, let's stop spending 20 grand to get one sale. That's it. Exactly. And, and I think that's kind of, it's taking the time to understand, but you see that, that, that's where a lot of businesses, I think, um, are stuck in this cycle that they think more you, you put out a post a while ago, maybe, well, maybe a couple of weeks ago, actually. And I think you may have, you may have said it a couple of times and that is, uh, in the same sort of, um, in the same sort of you know, breath that just because your post your LinkedIn post mm -hmm. gets lots of engagement doesn't mean you're going to get anything out of it. Yep. And it rang true. And I still remember that from your post from all that. And you probably said it a few times now, actually in different, in different ways. And actually it's really stuck with me because I think when my guys are measuring the success of our posts, um, it's very easy to look at engagements. You know, mm -hmm. how many likes did it get? Um, and that's, and, uh, and likes, you know, who, who doesn't like a like, yeah. everybody likes likes, but actually what was, and I think the word, the operative word here is intent. Mm -hmm. What is the intent? You know, was it just an entertaining post? If that's, mm -hmm. if that, if so, then yeah, sure. Engagement is probably a really good parameter, but you know, I, I've had posts out there and you know, I, I don't get anywhere near the numbers you get, but, um, if I, I, I have had posts out there that, you know, got, you know, 40,000 views, you know, five, you know, five, six, 700 likes, engagements, nothing because it was pure entertainment. Yeah. But then in the same breath, I've had posts where I've got like three likes and a lead. Yeah. You know, and so when you, when you look at these two side by side, if somebody didn't know that that lead came through, that one that had, mm -hmm. you know, lower engagements probably looks like a, a bit of a flop. Yeah. So your 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 idea your your note about you know how the intent and the engagement piece really stuck with me and now I always tell my guys to say look it doesn't matter if a post doesn't do well engagement wise mm -hmm. people still see it because you can mm -hmm. see people viewing it most of the best posts what i found is 
And uh, I was a bit obsessed for a long while about the likes. And um, I did a few funny videos. And every, every now and then I'll do a funny video just to, see, you know, because sometimes I'm in a devilish mood. I did a stupid one the, over the weekend. But um, likes aren't, <laughs> likes don't pay the bills. No, absolutely not. That's the first thing. But, you know, visibility is important being seen because that can build trust and all that kind of stuff. But ultimately I found that the, the posts that have made me the most money have the least likes and the least views mm -hmm. because people often the people who want to buy from you don't want to signal that they want to buy from you. They're watching in the background, observing, checking you out, building that trust, seeing what's going on. And then I, I get the messages and I'm like, who is this person? Mm. i've never seen them on my posts you know or the name's familiar but it's not like somebody who's just there all the time mm -hmm. and i think people miss that mm. i think people miss that but it is good to kind of like use some of your posts to like get a bit of your personality across who you are because you know people buy into you they buy into me it's a great qualifier actually of what is a good client if i go on you know i do these weird lives in the morning and I do them, one, because video is so immersive. People get to know you really well through video. That's why I like doing this stuff. But they buy into you. Mm. And if they buy into you at that point, it makes the next stage, you know, Terry, I, I read that post about AI and the future of AI, and you were bang on the money. Can we talk? There's already a sense of trust, whereas mm. if you just, like, I'm not, you can do whatever you like, but if you just talk to a, if you'd outbound a complete stranger, I'm yeah. not saying it's one or the other here. I'm just saying the difference. Mm -hmm. Somebody coming in off seeing your post, there's a ton of trust built. There's a ton of credibility built and they're inquiring with you. So people say, what's the value of content? Trust, I think. I think great trust. answer. That's, that's, a, that's, that, that's, a, that's a great answer because I think that also answers my for for a long time you know i think sometimes with content a lot of people try to place the value of content like they would place the value on a sales call mm -hmm. and it's not because um the intent is different in that uh, and I'm, I'm really glad you've said that because content is there to build trust and, and break out and, and be an icebreaker mm -hmm. and i think that piece there where you said people get to know and trust you silently mm -hmm. I think that bit there, you can't quite measure that. Mm -hmm. And I think you're absolutely right in that there are people who are going to be silent. You know, not everybody likes to um, operate on LinkedIn with lots of engagement and actions and link, you know, and likes and shares. And not everybody like people just read. Some people mm -hmm. just like to read. But just because they haven't engaged doesn't mean that they haven't taken in what you've said, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I think that's bang on that. I think that is. That's really actually that's made that's really made um made me think about the way why we why we post sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's one thing AI can't measure. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But I think I, I, I know the benefit of there's some basic admin tasks that and basic things in my business that we go, do you know what? In fact, we did this um just a couple of weeks ago, we uh, well, say a couple of weeks, well, three, four months ago, we had Shopify running, we had this running, we had that running, we had Zapier running, we had all of these things. And I was like, do you know what we need to do? We need to just chop down some of this stuff because every time you, every time you make something more complicated, you need more humans. And so we yeah. went, what's the yeah. simplest way to operate this where we don't need humans? So we went, well, do we need this email marketing platform? Can we do it in this platform? Do we need Shopify to then link up to something else? So we went, do you know what? Let's just spend the time simplifying so that we can systemize some things. Mm -hmm. no, nowhere near where we want to be, but there's a lot of things like that we're doing that we don't need to do. And there's some things that only humans should be doing. Mm -hmm. And I think every business should probably have that, like almost like a, um, what's things that I need to do? You know, we talk about it, do it or delegate it, right? Yeah. 
but there's actually another box to that automate it mm -hmm. do it delegate automate it mm, i like that and i think everybody should you know maybe you should make a new eisenhower matrix <laughs> you seen the eisenhower matrix yeah 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 what is it do delegate de defer and delete yeah yeah i think it's something like that yeah yeah you should have a fifth box automate that'd be a cool post by the way terry you should yeah, do that, that would be uh, i've invented the uh the the terry chu matrix it replaces <laughs> the eisenhower matrix yeah, the, we've yeah. added another, we've added another ingredient yeah, yeah i think i think every business should look at that and go if there's a repetitive task we talk about fulfillment and purpose in work mm, for employees yeah. beautiful yeah if you've got like repetitive task, it's the, it's a surefire way to demoralize somebody in this day and age. That's mm -hmm. the reality of it, right? Data entry, anything like that, that's straightforward. You can automate and go, right. What's the really interesting stuff we can get people to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you'll make a far more productive business doing that. So I think, I think you should absolutely do the five box, the Ch Terry Chew matrix. That's brilliant. No, I think you're absolutely right. On that note about people's jobs, and I think this go. I think I think going back to something that you said earlier on about should we automate everything and what happens to people's jobs? I think a lot of people think AI automation. Oh, people will lose. A lot of people will lose jobs. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is true. People will lose jobs, but it will also force them to upskill and do something they want to do. Mm -hmm. they actually want to do nobody wants to do repetitive tasks over and over again some people they're, they're, there's something in everyone that they want to do something more you mm -hmm. know and and i think this i think i think this just is just forcing people to become better mm -hmm. become better versions of themselves i think you know um we're getting a bit kind of deep here but money's a great thing you know not having it is a terrible thing mm -hmm. but but in the end, you know, we all want to make a difference in some way. Mm. We all yeah. want to feel that what we've done had some value to it. You know, we can we can say, oh, a job is just there to have a family and all. That's great. Yeah, that's fine. But if all you're doing it for, there's no meaning to it. Mm -hmm. At least if you're doing so, you know, even if, you know, the robot's doing the data processing, but you get to do something interesting that actually, you know, is a cog in a system that makes a difference there's a feeling of purpose to the job absolutely no and I, I fully you agree. know I, I i see automation as a brilliant thing i think we're going to go through that kind of maybe we've already done it i don't know but we're going to go through that kind of crypto uh, phase where it's going to everybody's going to be obsessed that it's going to change everything everything and 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 you know we're going to automate humans getting out of bed and you know, we're all going to, maybe I'll ask you about the metaverse, but have you ever seen the film Surrogate? Yeah, yeah. With Bruce Willis in it. Yeah. That we're all going to end up sat in computer chairs and our robots are going to go around. Yeah, I, I, I think it's actually the opposite. I think it's the opposite. I actually think it's going to free us. I actually mm. think, it's, I think it's going to free us from our chairs and let us, and let us have the time and space to go and do those things away from our computers and chairs and offices and and or home offices and and actually go and see more mm -hmm. of you know the stuff that we of, of outdoor and i actually think it's the complete opposite i actually think that automation is going to free us from those monotonous jobs those repetitive jobs that allows us to go and do things that are purposeful like you said mm -hmm. and i think um yeah, I, I think I think that's what 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 he's going to do. Is I don't think it, I don't see it as a bad thing at all. Um, you know, with all with all things like technology, if you if like like you said before, you only get out what you put in. If you put have bad intentions in it, it bad things are going to come out of it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, absolutely, I, I think it's going to free us. Do you know what I'd really love? I'll tell you what I'd really love. I'd love some kind of AI or automation whereby. Um, like an AI VA, an AI VA. Yeah, I mean, like just on, things yeah. like you know, like you've got Google Assistant. Yeah, yeah, and and Alexa, and you say Alexa, remind me of something, or schedule a time. 
I'd love something that's a bit more sophisticated than that, mm -hmm. where you can say, um, you know, Alexa, remind me of this later, or Alexa, add this to my task list. Mm -hmm. and, and then I can go, Alexa, tell me what's on my task list and kind of have it a bit more integrated. So it's not just audio, it's visual as well. Mm, yeah. I'd love something like that. Or Alexa, can you find a time for, now I know you can get individual tools to do each bit, mm. but then you have a bank of tools that you have to merge. I'd love yeah. like, um, maybe a, a, an AI EA. <laughs> that would be brilliant. Not for like really complicated things, but no, 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 like... no, no. I, I know what you mean. I, I think I don't think we're I don't think we're too far from that. Mm. I don't think we're too far from that. We, I mean, this was about a year ago when we discovered this. We used to buy our dog food from Amazon. Well, no, we used to buy it from Pets at Home, but then mm. we started to buy it from Amazon because it was too late for me to go out that night. So we bought it off Amazon. We started to buy it regularly off Amazon. After a while. Alexa started to ask us out of the blue, no prompt, if we're run, if we're okay, if we're running out of dog food, and would you like would you like to place an order? Out of interest, I said yes, and it arrived the next day. Wow! Now that level of intel, bit creepy for some people, <laughs> but for me, I that for me it was an eye opener because I then realized, well, what else? What else could I buy? What about even things like toilet roll? You know, when it starts to recognize how often we buy toilet roll. I don't, we don't buy toilet roll, but if we did, you know, and all these things, you know, it's all, it's not Alexa, it's Amazon. Mm -hmm. It's Amazon that's actually gaining from this. Alexa's just a, a vehicle, a pod. It's just another shop front, you know, mm -hmm. disguised as an assistant. Yeah. But it's just another shop front. But how clever is that where, it understands your basic needs, washing tablets, soap, you know, all these things. Can you imagine? Well, I can tell you one scenario that's happened to me today, and I'm sure everybody's had this. And some people, uh, you know, there are dangers to this, but, you know, I, I somebody said, do you, all these big companies knowing everything about you, but it's not a big company. It's not like they don't know me. It's just numbers and data. I'm just a number, right? So I don't really care if they know. But I was sat at home last night, and we've got um, two cats. Um, the cat, we've moved the furniture around um, in the house, and we've moved from, we have a big lounge and then a, a smaller, more cozy one. And we said, Do you know what? Winter's coming in. Let's, like, decamp into the smaller one because it's easier to heat, and our house is all electric. So we're like, Ugh. We got a quote. I don't know. Put it on LinkedIn. It was like eight grand for my electricity for the next year. So it's like we're moving to the small one. We got a log wood burner in there, so it's like great. So anyway, the cats usually hang out in there, so they've got used to hanging out in there. We've moved all our furniture in, the nice stuff, not the like rough stuff that we just doss around in. And now they're like, oh no, right? So I'm like, these cats scratching the furniture, right? All my YouTube ads now have this spray that you can put on furniture uh, for cats. Yeah, that's and happened. it's like, that's kind of handy, but at the same time, kind of creepy. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it does show you that there's a lot of good to this. I mean, people would go, oh, my privacy. Well, nobody knows this, really. You've not got Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos sat there going, oh, look at Dean. Dean's got two cats. Just <laughs> it's like, it's all de automated decision making. There's it, it not is. a person behind it. <laughs> I, I fully agree with that. I, 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 I think I think you're right. I think just because, yeah. I mean, there's two schools of thought. Yeah, sh should they be listening to you? Maybe not. Does it actually help? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. And the whole privacy thing is quite. It's quite a it's quite a tricky subject here. Should they? Or, or should they? And you know, could, you know, could they do it, but should they do it? Mm -hmm. And that, and that's the thing. I had a similar thing where, you know, and we were no, not in any technology whatsoever, just in a room, we were talking with friends about Disney cruises a yeah, while ago. And then in the morning on Facebook, the Disney cruise ads. Now, when you click on the, you know, why am I seeing this ad? It always gives you something to know, like you, 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 you fall within our 
target customer category or you know or mm. you know you, you are similar to one of our customers or, or something you know something like generic like that but we all know that they're all listening in mm-hmm. um and you know there's lots of stories like that and i think you're absolutely right is it is it bad i, d- I don't know i mean if uh, the only danger i see from it is like propaganda yes that's the biggest like you know we're seeing it at the moment there's stuff going oh you know we'll not go into the politics of any of this stuff but mm-hmm. um you know if some of the this intel uh, exposes our vulnerabilities to you know human beings are vulnerable to propaganda we are all vulnerable to repetitive messaging and all that kind of stuff that's something we are incredibly mm-hmm. vulnerable to mm-hmm. but i think i think we lost control of that a long time ago with the oh yeah you know, newspapers you know that that kind of is gone and now we have to kind of grow up grow up, put adult pants on and go i can't just believe what i'm told because everybody's you know i'm not getting cynical here and yeah, saying no you're, 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 you're absolutely right i think i think where the danger is when you've got um individuals um so the likes of you know you and i were you know fully versed in how social media works and you yep. know why we might be seeing ads and, and certain things and that's that's that, that's fine it's helpful for people but i think maybe there's like a generation like you know my parents generation where they're a bit older and they don't quite understand they do they probably do believe everything that they mm-hmm. see online you know and you know my mum's in the 70s now and she often i often have called and then she'll say oh i'll watch this video and they're saying this and I'm saying, well, don't believe what they're saying. And they, she said, well, why would they tell a lie? You know, and there's, and it's like that that innocence of, well, why would somebody say it if it's not true? Mm-hmm. You know, and I said, well, because they want to get views up and they want to sell ads. Mm-hmm. And that was way over her head and she couldn't yeah. quite understand. Yeah, so, it's, it's, like, it's like politics, right? Politics. I, I saw one today and it was like on one side they said, oh, uh, these people have had a, a a real terms pay rise of 8.6%. And then on the other side, they were saying, um, sorry, no, uh, a cash pay rise of 8.6%. And then they were saying on this side, it was a real terms pay cut of 2%. Same stats, just rehashed. Differently. Yeah. This yeah. one's like, oh, how much money did we actually pay increase you? And this one's okay. Yeah. But if we count inflation, you've actually given us a pay cut yeah 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 it's just the way it's the span yeah. uh everything everything you know That's i don't good. i don't want to be like cynical but th- there's we've known this forever there's two sides to every story and we just have to be kind of grown up about this stuff yeah. and go Agreed. i've got to make my own decisions i've got to weigh everything up you know i can you know the brilliant thing about today's day and age you can launch a business and be up and running in two or three hours. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, the downside is you could buy from a business who's launched in two or three hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's like, you know, you can have, you know, you can go to Fiverr. Uh, you, you know, you'll know this getting reviews from people. It's easier to get a negative review on somebody than get a positive. Mm-hmm. You have to mm-hmm. fight for positive reviews yeah. or build yeah. mechanics in to do it. Negative ones are brilliant. They come in thick and fast when you need when you don't need you them. You don't need them, yeah. Right. But you can go to Fiverr and like give me I I will get you five hundred reviews on Trustpilot. And it's like you gotta weigh this up. You gotta kind of it's just it's just a different world, I think, we're coming into where so- it's a very it's 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 a world on steroids and everything is bigger faster more scalable and when things happen things happen very quickly and you know on a, on a really big scale and i think a lot of people aren't quite geared up for that yet and they, mm. they're quite you know so no you're absolutely right yeah so terry um if somebody's looking to kind of you know they're looking and going Shh, what can i do yeah you're open to talking with people who's who is and isn't somebody you could talk to or help just just lay out if somebody's like i'd love to kind of automate some stuff but i really don't know what i can and can't do what's possible what's realistic what's like shooting for the moon kind of thing 
our experience is in the is in the finance sector. We help a lot of um, uh, finance lenders, brokers, mortgage lenders, brokers, letting agents, anybody who is who deals with kind of uh, vetting and um, and and, and vet, vetting you know customers, businesses, or customers. Um, and actually, we do help. You know, our best customers are actually classed as SMEs. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, our best customers are, you know, two, three, four, five man bands because those are the people who want to scale without headcount. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's not actually, we're, we're trying to take technology that is available to, you know, the corporates, the big banks and the big uh, big enterprises and bring that to, you know, the the sort of s- the smaller businesses that want to scale mm-hmm. and don't know, don't know how to do it and can't automate because they think these tools are unavailable to the big boys. And actually, it's not true. We, we, that, that's our, 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 our main thing is that we want to help, you know, SMEs and mid-sized businesses do better by bringing them technology that's available to the big boys. So, so somebody's in the kind of finance sector yeah. and you're like, you know, we're, we're a small business, four or five of us. We mm-hmm. want to make sure we're using the best use of technology. Mm-hmm. And I guess not off the shelf as in Zapier, but we don't want to spend millions of pounds building some big machine. You'll yeah. give them not quite Zapier. No, we have no. We, we, we've we've we, Zapier. Yeah, we've got. We've basically got two sides of the business. We've got the agency business, which is custom development for exactly what your business needs and wants. Mm-hmm. And then we've got a SaaS solution, which is um, a decision automation system where. It's uh, we we have a direct plug-in with um, a consumer credit and business credit and off the back off a small uh, monthly fee you can automatically credit check your customers whether it's B two B or B two C whether it's consumers or businesses and run it through the decision engine and you get a decision out the back of that or if you don't want the decision logic you can just credit check them with our system and it will feed it back to your system so we only want to deal with people who have credit scores of you know 600 and above you'll get 600 and above and mm. that's that's what our SaaS system does it's not it's, it's it's a plug and play you plug in you tell us who you want to check we check it we feed the result back to you that's it no bells and whistles right. that's our SaaS system and that's a small monthly fee and then if you want something more bespoke and you know something that will integrate with all your other systems suppliers or uh, and customers and automate a lot of the headache, uh, open banking, credit checks, land registry, DRLA, all these things that are autom- that, that, that you need data from, we can build those as a custom build for you as well. So, so there's two sides of the business. Just, just to ask, just before we wrap up, I know we've gone on a little bit, but just to ask then, if you had a mortgage brokering business that wasn't mm-hmm. like just solopreneur broker, mm-hmm. but, you, you know, there's a couple of brokers within the business, you know, that mm-hmm. kind of thing, and they're going, right, I'm going to help you get a mortgage. They could pull that in and, and look at it and go, right, okay, give me your open banking and all that kind of stuff through that kind of system. Would that work for like? That's exactly, yeah. So like a mortgage broker will probably have a panel of lenders, 10, 20 lenders that they can probably, you know, um, depending on the, the their, their, their customer circumstances, but they're going to have to collect those documents, those bank statements and look at their income and the pay slips and make a judgment on actually that lender or that lender or that lender. Our system will do that automatically and say, "Hey, these are this is the criteria from all your ten and twenty lenders. This is your client, and they've got a credit score of X, and this is what their expenditure is and their income is." And it, within seconds, our system can review all of that and say, "Actually, lender one, two, and seven would be more suitable. Don't bother with all the others. Just send it to one, two, and seven. Oh, they pay more commission. Let's put them to put it to them." So that mm-hmm. that's what the system does, but it's a much more tailored solution because it requires a much more tailored set of criteria. That's awesome. So Terry, best way to get in touch with you, drop you an email or find you on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, I mean, find me on LinkedIn uh, or you can just visit our website, venturemotion.co.uk. Um, you know, it's not, we're not a, you know, we're not a big brand. We're not a big corporate. There's only, you know, a few of us that will get back to you. So most likely it'll be me. Um, so yeah, drop us, you know, drop, drop, drop on our website. Terry, this has been fascinating. Um, and it looks like from what we've been talking about, uh, in 10 years time, we'll still be alive. We won't be working for the robots. Uh, we, the robots won't have nuked us or destroyed us or <laughs> any of that, but we might have a more purposeful and more interesting work life and 
um, private life if if AI can make that easier. So, Terry, Indeed. thank you for coming on. For thank you for having me. Thank you for braving this as well. So I really appreciate it. And uh, everybody listening and watching, please go check out Terry's LinkedIn profile. Watch what he's up to. And if there's stuff that you think, do you know what, what Terry's doing, he could help us in our business. Our business fits with him. Drop him a line. He's not the kind of guy who's just going to go and sell you something that you don't need. He'll talk to you. And if he can help you, he will. And if he can't, he'll tell you. So Terry, thanks again for joining me. And everybody, thanks for watching. Stay tuned for the next edition of the podcast coming really, really soon.